Ah, okay, got it. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction, Tom, and, and also to you, Jeffrey. It, it's an honor to be here at this, I think, um, really uh, incredible and unique reading series that is here that you all have, and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I would just correct the introduction in one small way, which is I actually did stop at Smitty's for a little of that bre yeah. unadvisable breakfast brisket, which I just couldn't pass up. It's sort of rumbling around in there right now. Um, I am going to uh, primarily read from the book of mine that's coming out. This is a sneak preview of the book. The book will be out April 19th is the publication date. So um, this is like a, you know, it's like a trailer. Um, I'll do the whole thing in a trailer voice, in a time <laughs> when. Um, uh, but, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the process of the, the some of what I, th I think um, the book, uh, some of the questions the book brings up. Um, but I'm also very happy to take questions about the magazine um, after that is over if we have time. Uh, but I'm going to start by just talking about the book. Um, as they said, the book is called Nothing Happened. And then it did, and it's a chronicle uh, in both fact and fiction. It's got eight chapters. Four of the chapters are non-fictional, and four of the chapters are fictional, and <coughs> sort of alternates back and forth. Um, it's my attempt to fool people into thinking that I did things that I didn't actually do. Um, the narrator of the book stays the same throughout, and so this creates, I, I, I hope, some interesting questions for the reader about um, you know, how much to believe the person that is talking to that the narrator. Um, I'm going to read, though, from one of the chapters that you can, be, you can actually trust and you can believe. It's one of the non-fictional chapters. Um, but it's one of the non-fictional chapters that I think has a quality that is a little bit, there, there are some qualities about it that are a little hard to believe, um, <laughs> which, uh, which sort of works in the context of this project. This is a chapter that um, uh, describes my um, entry in and attendance at an amateur poetry festival in Reno in a, at a, the, uh, John Asquaga's Nugget Casino in Reno, Nevada. And um, a few years ago, I entered a contest that I saw an adver <laughs> advertisement for in a newspaper uh, that would enable me to potentially win $25,000 um, at an amateur poetry contest. So I entered a one of my <laughs> home of mine in this contest and um, attended this, uh, this convention. It um, cost me about 600 bucks to go. But that seemed like a, you know, a worthwhile investment on the, ch on the chance of winning 25 grand. Needless to say, I did not win the 25 grand. Um, I'm going to just read a little bit from the very beginning of this piece when I arrive at the convention, and then I'm going to read from the very dramatic uh, awards presentation at the end of the three-day convention. And I should just say one last thing. The name of the outfit that put on this, um, this convention was the famous Poet Society, which sounds pretty great. And you, know, you think, you know, John Keats, William Wordsworth. But actually, what the, famous, the way that the famous Poet Society <coughs> defines famous poet is that if you're famous, like for being a B or even a C or even a D movie actor, and you have written at least one poem, you are a famous poet. And so <laughs> that, <laughs> those, were the, um, those were the kind of instructors that we had during our, during our three days at the Nugget Casino guys who'd been an, an orderly in the slumber party massacre in 1983 who also had written some poems and so it was a very um, it was it was a very kind of a circus atmosphere a lot of a lot of interesting stuff happening um, and uh, this is this will just take you through the introduction the <coughs> arrival and then the awards ceremony first time here a man asked me he was wearing a jeans jacket and jeans he had a bristly brown beard and a long, hawk-like nose. His name tag identified him as Doc Smith. Yes, I told him. Yours? Nah, he said, I've been here before. So you like it? Eh, it's all right. He scanned the crowd with a sour expression. Only thing that gets annoying is all these 13-year-old girls writing about broken hearts, lost love, suicide, that sort of thing. Try going to war. Doc's voice was gruff, and his bearing suggested a long-standing annoyance with the world. He was a Vietnam veteran. I wondered if he'd ever shared the battlefield with Professor Williford, who's a character from a previous chapter. Before the war, he had been a singer in a band called People, whose song, I Love You, had traveled up the charts to number 14 in 1968. He sang a few bars for me. It sounded like a good song for dancing close with a girl. He gave me his card, which said, Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 290, 
in big letters and in small letters, John Doc Smith, the poet. This is an okay conference, he said, but it's not as nice as the one the International Library of Poetry puts out. When they have a champagne reception, it's all the champagne you could want, plus punch and hors d'oeuvres and top flight entertainment. Classy. He looked disparagingly at the tables. This one's going downhill. It was true that the scene lacked glamour. The Rose Ballroom did not feel much like a ballroom. The walls were carpeted in institutional gray, the floor in a tacky pattern of red and blue. The stage was empty save for an off-center podium. Fluorescent tubes lit the room unkindly, and on folding tables covered in red paper, the champagne was lined up in plastic glasses. The supply was sorely insufficient. Mostly the tables were covered with empty glasses, upside down and on their sides. They don't put enough champagne, I heard an elderly Filipino man in a three-piece suit complain. Doc seemed to know his way around the convention, so I asked him if he had any tricks for winning the cash prize. Nah, he said, just do your thing. Don't get nervous. Before he could finish his counsel, the MC of the convention, Alicia Rodriguez, called us to order. Doc snorted. He'd seen it all before, and he was going to go try his luck on the slots. According to the general schedule, we were to be introduced to the poets who would be our teachers for the next three days. There was Rig Kennedy, who had a supporting role in the 1982 film The Slumber Party Massacre, <laughs> Joel Weiss, who played an orderly in The Meteor Man, and Al D'Andrea, who appeared as Lieutenant Wilkins in the short-lived television drama Brooklyn South. I'm going to jump ahead to the end. Uh, the, to the awards presentation. The famous Poet Society had impressed upon us all throughout the convention that we were winners. That as far back as the first night when we had put pen to paper, we had ceased to lose. But some would leave Reno with less than others. This fact was underscored by the $6,000 in door prizes that greeted our entrance to the Rose Ballroom. After this preamble, Alicia made ready to announce the names of the winning poets. Behind her, the stage was set with a winner's circle of chairs, 17 chairs for the $1,000 third prizes, and one each for the second, first, and grand prizes, worth $3,000, $5,000, and $25,000. We all stared hungrily. <coughs> we all stared hungrily at the $25,000 seat, on which lay a red fur robe with a leopard print fringe and a 12-foot train. A matching crown in red, leopard, and gold, inlaid with red and green jewels, and a golden scepter. <laughs> the ballroom was tense. Muscles stiffened. Nails were chewed. I saw at least one lucky charm brought out. <laughs> Extra sarf for wild and free, Alicia cried, and the first winner, an old fellow from Ketchikan, Alaska, with a giant white beard, mounted the stage. He read his poem, which was about orca whales, and we gave him a short hand. There was no time to dwell on the relative merits of the poem. Fortuna's wheel was spinning. Sandra Young Obendorf for Celestial Butterflies. A woman seated several tables to my left let out a small scream and ran through the crowd, throwing her arms in the air and leaping. When she read the title of her poem, she imitated the flight of a butterfly with her hands. <laughs> Vanessa O. Sullivan. Sorry, Vanessa. Vanessa O'Sullivan for Born Black. A white woman in a cowboy shirt rushed the stage. This is the second time I'm here, the first time I won. So to all of you, keep trying. Her poem was about being an oddball in a conventional family. Robert Nielsen for Dance. Over to my right, a man in a dark suit popped up and pumped his fists in the air, screaming, yes, yes, yes. Some of the winners let out huge sighs of relief and gra gazed graciously to heaven. Some were catapulted into frenzies of hugging and crying and clutching of the cheeks. One girl whose winning poem was titled, My Elusive Heart, immediately began to fan herself, as if she were worried that she might overheat. She fanned herself all the way up to the stage and then stood speechlessly at the podium for a quarter of a minute. Finally, she shrieked, world peace, and burst into tears. <laughs> 